Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. We're here this week with uh, Philippe Lagasse from Carleton University, one of the premier experts on the Westminster system in Canada. And uh, I figured because we are now in an election that uh, we would start by talking dissolution. Uh, there's been a lot of misleading stuff going around about that and um, figured we'd at least start with uh, get, getting a, a clear reason as to why Mary Simon was never going to say no. Yeah, well, first off, thanks uh, for having me on here with you, Dale. I think this is an important issue. And as you highlighted, uh, there's a lot of misinformation about it. And it's been an issue where we've seen some fundamental misunderstanding just over the years, actually. This is not new to this particular parliament, nor is it new even to this government or even uh, the fixed election, fixed state election law. So uh, I think a lot of this misunderstanding about where the governor just general's discretion lies comes back or goes back to what occurred in the 2008 uh, prorogation crisis. And at that time, a good deal of debate started emerging about what exactly is the governor general's discretion to review, refuse prime ministerial advice. And because there were so many comments and so much scholarship written at the time that was trying to say that, no, you know, the governor general definitely had discretion in that particular moment in time to refuse the, the advice to prorogue, then necessarily, you know, the governor general has a whole bunch of discretion in a whole bunch of other areas, uh, particularly around these two key powers, right, prorogation and dissolution. Yeah. And so let's just set the, the matter clear here, which is that fundamentally, uh, does the governor general have discretion when it comes to requests to dissolve? Yes, but, and the but is, is key here. The two conditions under which a governor general might refuse a request to dissolve are first, that, that there's just been uh, a general election. So, you know, she can refuse up to, let's say, some people would say six months, some people would say nine, max if you're pushing it, maybe 12. So that's one condition. But you also need the other condition, which is if you are going to refuse a request on the part of the prime minister to dissolve parliament within that window, there has to be another government in waiting for you to call upon them, right? And that's the key thing is that if the crown refuses the prime minister's advice, effectively, the crown is declaring its non-confidence in the government. It's saying, I don't, I'm not trusting you to act constitutionally. Therefore, I'm going to call upon uh, another government. Right. So typically it doesn't get to that. The prime minister will ask. They'll be told no. Let's say if we look at the Christy Collard scenario in 2017 BC, you request, you're told no, and you resign. And that's the end of the story. And then another government is called in. And so in that particular yeah, case, it was right after an election and there was another viable uh, governing situation in, in the work or in the in the in the wings. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we. And we saw this in New Brunswick as well uh, when Brian Gallant recently tried to test the confidence of the legislature there. He, and we can get into as well who gets to be prime minister because <laughs> uh, that situation is telling there too. But, you know, he loses confidence uh, and he resigns and, and then another government is formed. So those two conditions have to be in place. So when we're talking about dissolution today, not only is the parliament all, almost two years old, but the opposition parties aren't even pretending that they have a viable alternative to offer. So there's, there's no other course of action right now for the governor general. And you also had a really interesting post uh, a couple weeks ago about the reason why our system evolved the way it did so that um, if the governor general refuses advice, the prime minister needs to resign. Uh, can you just kind of uh, give us the brief history uh, of why that matters? Right. So I think when a lot of people think responsible government, they're, they immediately go to the idea that the government has to hold the confidence of the House of Commons. And you can call that, let's say, the Cardinal Convention, right? The Confidence Convention is the Cardinal Convention of Responsible Government. But it's not the foundational convention. And I think this is where you first have to kind of take everything into account. What I mean by foundational is the, the one that kind of started the whole thing going, right? Mm -hmm. And the first convention that we ended up developing, I mean, we wouldn't have used that language at the time, but it's simply that in order to protect the idea of the crown as the fount of justice, right, that the, count, the crown provided justice through its courts and through its law, it meant that the crown could never do any wrong. 
So when the crown or, or the actual monarch did screw up, they had to blame it on somebody. And that blame ended up being on the ministers, right? And over time, that's evolved such that ministers, those who actually make the decisions, have to wear whatever it is that the crown does, particularly in constitutional matters, right? Like they, they ultimately have to be the ones that take responsibility, which means, getting back to the dissolution question, if the prime minister requests a dissolution and the crown says no, what's the prime minister supposed to do? Go out and say, well, you know, I requested a dissolution. I still think we should have one, but the governor general doesn't think so. So there we are. You can point to certain international examples where that's been the case, but it's always kind of subtle, which is that it's always they've had a conversation, the crown pushes back and the prime minister or the first minister kind of walks back from it. It's not a situation typically where a first minister clings on to power after their advice has been refused because the, the, the basic foundational convention starts to yeah. uh, come um, to uh, fall apart. So now that we've covered dissolution, uh, I think the other thing we should have a, a conversation about is what happens at the end of the election. Because again, this is a, a situation where we get a lot of wrong things being said in the media. Um, and television news in particular is really bad at this. So under, so I guess we'll start with the fact that um, the prime minister is still the prime minister throughout the election and, and why that matters. Right, so let's be clear on things. So once there is a dissolution, we enter into what is often called the caretaker convention, but really all that really means, it's not really a convention. What it is, is it's the government, it's a practice that we've put in place that the government should act with restraint. So what that means is the government is still the government, it still exists, it still takes responsibility for all decisions of the executive, but ministers aren't supposed to make decisions that would bind another government, right? Nor are they supposed to make big decisions that would have a big impact if they can avoid it. What that doesn't mean, particularly today, is doesn't mean they can't handle the pandemic, doesn't mean they can't make decisions related to the pandemic, doesn't mean that the public service is running the government and that we have no ministers, right? So some networks will refuse to actually call the prime minister the prime minister. They're going to refer to him now as the liberal leader after this dissolution, which constitutionally makes no sense and just com complicates things enormously because people then don't understand, you know, what happens if he, uh, if his party is reelected with fewer seats, but he decides to stay in, par uh, in power. So it just muddies things quite a bit in this very strange, bizarre notion of impartiality, which, you know, frankly, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, and, but so the key thing is the government's always there and the prime minister is prime minister until he resigns or is dismissed. So we will prime minister Trudeau will be prime minister Trudeau up until such time as he decides that he's no longer going to be prime minister or the governor general dismisses him, which is highly unlikely. Um, and, and with that in mind as well, um, I think the way I tend to think of this is that the crown being either the queen or the governor general always needs to have someone to advise them. That's why, uh, there's always still a government in place at any time. Right. And that brings us back to that foundational convention, right? The foundational convention is important because the crown could never be without a prime minister to proffer advice. Because in the absence of that prime minister to proffer advice, who's taking responsibility? And therefore, who is going to end up being accountable, particularly to the House of Commons? Because as we know, the crown cannot enter the House of Commons. Yeah. So <laughs> in that context, how are you hold, you would not be able to hold the executive to account in the absence of a responsible minister. And uh, that's one of those foundational points. And uh, so with that in mind, um, it's election night. Um, people are going to start using words like prime minister elect. Um, let's, let's unpack this as to why this is, this is wrong. Okay, so prime minister elect is wrong for two reasons. First, uh, the prime minister is not elected, right? So number one, they are elected as an MP. Uh, if, let's say, Aaron O'Toole is invited to form a government, he's not being elected prime minister. He's being appointed prime minister based on the fact that he is the leader of the party that can better hold the confidence of the House. So in his case, he would be prime minister designate. I even have problems with that, but let's just... Assume that that's okay for administrative person. Yeah. So he's not being elected. He's being designated to form a government. Trudeau, on the other hand, if his party comes back uh, with enough seats to maintain confidence in whatever configuration that may be, is simply going to be prime minister. Never changes. Yeah. Not going anywhere. So that uh, that is also a misnomer to say that he would be 
elect, designate, whatever else. Yeah, and this actually kind of bugged me after the last election is there was this notion that, you know, there was a transition, um, even though he was prime minister the whole time, it was the same government the whole time, there was no transition, it was just a cabinet shuffle. Right, and I think this is, I mean, this is one of these interesting ones where maybe that, that's where we're headed, right? We're just not saying it explicitly. So you'll have some Westminster context where just out of propriety's sake, the whole government kind of resigns and then they come back in just to kind of make this clean break with things and to kind of demonstrate that, you know, it's a, they're starting afresh or whatever. But in our context, it's all symbolism right now. Like it may, it may be yeah. symbolism that eventually gets somewhere. And I think governments like to legitimize themselves by kind of having the whole ceremony and making it seem like they have a mandate from the people based on the election. But if, you're, if you've been the government before the election and you're still the government after the election, then you're right. It's basically a cabinet shuffle. Um, all right. Well, those are some good things to think about. And, um, you know, we're going to be... Uh, the next five weeks kind of uh, dealing with some of these misnomers. So thanks for uh, giving us some of this clarity and um, we'll do this again sometime. Sounds great, Dale. Thanks. Thanks. And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith. That's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks, everyone.